Welcome to the Fiji for Beginners workshop. Before we get started learning how to use Fiji, let's go through a brief introduction into digital imaging. My name is Dr. Paul McMillan from the Centre for Advanced Histology and Microscopy at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. Let's start off with the digital image. So a digital image, uh, when we're taking it on a microscope, is what we call a raster image. And this image is formed by pixels and each of those pixels has an intensity, but also a physical size characteristic. Now the size is dependent on our sampling, uh, so we can actually set the, the pixel size, and also the uh, intensity scale, or what we call our gray level, or our dynamic range, is uh, controlled by something called bit depth, and we'll cover both bit depth and sampling resolution over the next few slides. So to start off with, bit depth. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the number of grayscale values going between zero intensity and maximum intensity. So if you look on the left hand side here, a one bit image is basically two gray levels, so either black or white. So two to the power of one is two. As we go up, two to the power of two gives us four gray levels, and we go up and up uh, until we come uh, into microscopy ranges, which normally start at about 8 bits. Why is this important? So if we look at a zoom in of an image, and we've got 4 by 2 pixels, one sampled at an 8 bit depth, which gives us 255 grayscale values, and one at a 16 bit depth, you can see that actually on the 8 bit scale we can't distinguish the intensity between these two pixels that are marked, but on a 16 bit scale we can. Now, why is that important? That allows us to visualize and also quantify a lot more detail within our image. I will show this example of a microscope image. So again, a one-bit image is either black or white. There's not very much uh, information going on there. But as we go up through the bit depth ranges, hopefully you can see there's much, much more information going on. And if we look at that and do some simple quantitative analysis, and we'll cover this in the Fiji for Quantification workshop, uh, a line analysis. We can look at the intensity along that line, and you can see on the one bit scale, we've got either zero or 255 grayscale values. And as we go up on the bit depth, you can see we're getting much, much more information about the intensities across that line. When it comes to equipment, and especially microscopy equipment, uh, the bit depths we're normally using can be either one, one bit, so two gray values, and we'll use that for creating things called binary masks for performing image analysis. As I mentioned, 8 bit is a fairly standard setting that's giving us 256 grayscale values, and we can go all the way up to 32 bit, which is giving us a crazy number of grayscale values. The general rule of thumb is if you're imaging just for visualization purposes, then 8-bit is probably fine. That's most uh, that's the level that most projectors and things can, can project at. If we're wanting to quantify the uh, data from that image, then you may want to increase up your bit depth to 12 or 16. Uh, that's possible on things like confocal systems. Uh, if you're using a, a system with a camera, then that's um, basically set by the uh, parameters of the camera. Next thing we can look at is image acquisition. So what do we want to do when we're sitting at a microscope? And the idea is that you want to get the best representation of what you can see down the eyepiece. That's this little circle on the left here. Uh, and get an image of the, uh, the, what represents that on your final image. What you should get is if you can't see very much down the eyepiece, then your image quality shouldn't be very good either. So crap in, crap out. 90% of the battle in microscopy is sample prep. So if you get your sample nice and bright, then the imaging should be very, very easy. The difficult thing in microscopy is that it's very easy if you either know what you're doing or alternatively don't know what you're doing to make something that looks very poor down the eyepiece actually look very, very good. So you can make any stain, either positive or negative, depending on the image settings that you put in. And you can ask your core about how exactly you should be setting those up. 
that you don't want there. So some of the things to consider are not using offsets when you're setting up your, your raw data. Uh, you can set your exposure settings using control samples, either positive or negative control samples. So set those to whatever's going to be brightest within your data set. If you're trying to directly compare samples, multiple different samples, then they should be acquired in exactly the same way. And also, it's a good idea to, to perform some pilot analysis before and during the, the image as well, uh, during your imaging experiments as well, so you don't get to the end of a data set and find out that you can't use it. Some other things to consider when you're setting up your image acquisitions is not to saturate your image, and we'll cover that in the next few slides. As already mentioned, use the uh, positive and negative controls to set up your exposure settings. Use the same settings between samples if you want to be able to directly compare them. Don't use the offset and perform a pilot analysis. Okay, so going back to the first point here, do not saturate your image. How can we tell whether our image is saturated or not? Well, within the imaging software, you should be able to find something like this. It's got an intensity graph. On the X scale, it has all the different intensity values within your image. So for this example on the left, that's going from 0 to 255 grayscale values. That is an 8-bit image, as we discussed before. And on the y-axis, it's the number of pixels with that intensity. So in this example, there's a lot of pixels in the green and red channels, which have very low intensity. And that tails off. And we're using probably just about halfway in terms of the dynamic range on this detector. So we're not saturating on this uh, example. On the example on the right-hand side, uh, you can see it's a different bit depth. So we're going 0 to 65,000 in this case. And in this case, we've got signal going all the way out, pretty much probably 90% of the dynamic range on the detector. So again, not hitting saturation, but using more of the dynamic range in this case. What's another way to avoid saturation? So a lot of the imaging softwares now have a special lookup table, which you can apply, um, which will show you if there are saturated pixels. So in the example shown here, uh, on the top, you can see that the little red pixels within the image are saturated, and you can see that represented in the uh, image histogram as well. That we're we've got a lot of pixels at the very highest peak on the on the dynamic range. If this is the case, you can either decrease your excitation power percentage, decrease your camera exposure time increase your scan speed and or decrease your gain if you're on a confocal. Next we'll go back to, to pixels and we'll look at resolution and sampling. So I already mentioned that uh, when you take microscopy images you're forming what's called a raster image. So everything's broken up into pixels and the intensities are assigned. And you guys might be used to working with things in Photoshop or something like this, where if you draw an object, that's what's called a vector image, where all the curves within this duck here are represented by mathematical equations. So if you zoom in, uh, it won't get more pixelated, whereas a raster image, your pixelation is set at the time of acquisition or forming the image. So we need to make sure we get the pixel sizes right for what you want to analyze down the track. Okay, so we'll continue with the blue duck as an example. And we're going to break that up into a number of dis different pixels. And the question for you guys is to have a think and uh, let, let me know um, when you think that you can see that there's a blue duck in the image. So if we go with a frame size of 3x3, three three, I think we can safely say there's no blue, no blue duck, obviously, within that image. If we go to 5 by 5 we might be able to say that we've just about got the outline of, um, of the duck there. By the time we get to 10 by 10 we'd be more confident. And at 20 by 20 you're pretty sure that that's a picture of a duck, right? So the sampling of that, the 20 by 20 pixels, uh, 
is allowing us to interpret the image as, a, as what we want to see. But if the question was how many eyes can you see on the duck, then you might need to go to a slightly different level, right? So this is something you have to think about when you're setting up your acquisition settings. What is it that I'm actually wanting to visualize and potentially quantify at the end of my experiment? Fortunately, there's a, an equation that we can use which helps us to uh, determine this, and it's called the Nyquist-Shannon sampling rate. And this states, to optimally represent an analog signal in digital space, the analog signal needs to be sampled at least 2.3 times. Uh, so if you look at the example in the bottom here, these blue wavy lines are our analog signal, and the red line is our digital uh, representation of that. So at 0.83, you can see we're undersampling. The red line doesn't look like the blue line. At 1.3x, it's getting closer, but it's not exactly the same. At 2.3 times, the digital sampling is pretty close, but again, not perfect. And at 10x, it's a much better representation, but you know this may be oversampling. Uh, fortunately for us, there are calculators that work this out for us, and a lot of the acquisition softwares now have a button which either states Nyquist or um, has an optimal button or something which will do these calculations for you. There's a link here to the Nyquist calculator from, from SVI. And basically what this is doing is looking at um, your theoretical axial resolution and dividing it by that 2.3 value. So the table at the bottom here looks at some of the common um, magnifications on microscopes. The key thing for resolution on, a, on an objective is the numerical aperture, which is the next column across. And then we've got four of our kind of common um, fluorophore ranges as well. So if we look at, for example, the 63X, 1.4 NA oil, immersion objective you can see in the green channel it's suggesting that your pixel sizes should be in the order of 60 nanometers. Uh, this is of course only if you want to get the best possible resolution within your image so if you're trying to look at subcellular structures you would set your pixel sizes to 60 nanometers. If you're trying to count nuclei then obviously you don't need that level of, of resolution. Next thing, some of the basic rules of digital images. So number one is always save it in the raw file format. So depending on what instrument you're using, that will be a different file format. So Leica, Zeiss, Olympus, Delta Vision, Nikon, all have their own individual files. And this is really important because it not only saves your image data, but it also contains all the metadata about how that image was acquired. You can open that up later and go back and try and work out you know, what your microscope settings were. Second rule is if you're going to export that data out, make sure you do it in a lossless format. So for example, if you export out as a TIFF file, it will keep all of the original information. That's very good for data analysis. If you save it out as a JPEG, GIF, or a PNG file, and this is what's known as a lossy compression. You actually lose information here. You can still use these, but I'd suggest they're only for PowerPoint or your lab book, um, that type of thing, and not actually quantitative analysis. Rule number three, save all modifications. So never process the raw data file. You should always keep that. And save each modification as you go and annotate the file name so you know what's been done to each of the images as you go through your workflow. Rule number four, back up your data. Back up, back up, back up. Um, so it's a requirement with your funding body that you uh, safely back up your data um, for something up to five to eight years, depending on the different funding bodies have different rules. Um, and it's a good idea to have some redundancy in your in your data backups. A lot of the universities now have um, redundancy inbuilt if you're saving uh, onto their own servers. And the other thing is never to use the instrument computer as a place to safely back up your data. 
So lots of other people have access to your data as well, probably, and can accidentally um, delete or modify that. Rule number five is to beware of image modification. So although you're generating a picture, you can also think of it as an Excel spreadsheet with numbers in, and hopefully people wouldn't go in and start randomly changing numbers within an Excel spreadsheet. So if you're trying to make your image beautiful, you're also manipulating that data. So some examples here of fluorescent images. Uh, here we've got a group of cells, fluorescent cells. And if we do a very simple contrast adjustment, we can actually see that two of these groups are actually being brought in from another image. So kind of copied and pasted into this image that so have come from a completely separate image acquisition. Obviously, that's not that's not ethical. In this example, uh, they have both positive and negative controls and their uh, experimental sample, which is good. But again, if we do a simple contrast adjustment, we can see that these images have actually been dealt with differently. Uh, so the negative control is completely black, and you should never have a completely black image on a microscope. The positive control and the sample seem to have different backgrounds, which again suggests maybe they've been captured differently or they've been modified differently. Again, not ethical. Um, in terms of modifications, if you're making modifications to the whole image, then that is generally acceptable. So here we've got a three channel um, image taken on a confocal. But you can see it's not very bright. All the intensity values are on the left-hand side on the intensity graph. So it is allowed for you to actually uh, change these to make it brighter, more visible, as long as you make a statement in your figure legend or the materials and methods that you know, you've changed the brightness and contrast for um, visualization purposes. And if you look at our lookup table, you can see there's no red pixels there, which suggests saturation. If we go and modify this um, visualization to a point where we're hitting saturation, you can actually see it changes the interpretation of the, of the image. So if you look at magenta, these structures are much larger than they were before. This also means that you can't quantify the intensity of the pixels which have hit saturation. So that bottom one is misrepresented. Another thing to be aware of when you're um, making any modifications is that each of the journals has their own set of guidelines to, or instructions to authors. So these are taken from uh, the journal cell. Uh, we've already discussed the first one that any alterations should be applied to the entire image. And, any alteration should be clearly explained within the figure legend. Uh, only compare data that are appropriate to compare, so data from the same experiment acquired in the same way. And individual images should not be used in multiple figures unless figures describe different aspects of the same experiment. So I urge you to look at, you know, if you're looking to publish, look at the instructions to authors for your journal. Uh, if you're not looking to publish, then look at some of the papers that your group has published in recently and try and get a feel for what's allowed and not allowed. Um, my suggestions are, so you can adjust the minimum and maximum position for visualization, but not quantification. Again, as long as you're making it clear that that's what you've done in the figure legend. I'd suggest you don't adjust the gamma uh, nonlinear adjustment. Be descriptive in your uh, method section and be aware of color sensitivity and color blindness issues as well and also printing issues and we'll cover that last couple of points now over the last few slides so image presentation most fluorescence detectors are monochrome and that means that your images are usually in grayscale and they're converted to color using things called lookup tables, or LUTs. Three of the most commonly used lookup tables are the blue, green, and red lookup tables. So in this example, it goes from zero intensity black 
up to maximum intensity at 255 units. On this grayscale value, it's basically bright blue, green, or red, and it should be a linear scale in between those two points. When it comes to printing issues, um, when we're looking at our data on a computer, we're using what's called a red, green, blue color palette. So if your computer screen is made up of little pixels with red, green, and blue emitting from them, and depending on how much the intensity of each of these pixels are, it changes the color that you see. So obviously if you have pixels which are all red, no green and no blue, you're going to get red. If it's all green, no red and no blue, you're going to get green. If it's all blue, no red and no green, you're going to get blue. But if you have a mixture of red and green, that will give you yellow, and a mixture of red and blue will give you magenta. The printing issues come in because Printers don't use the RGB color scheme, they use something called CMYK, which works very, very differently. So in this representation, we can see the RGB color scheme is marked as this triangle, and the CMYK is marked as this uh, dotted line. And you can see, and you may have experienced this, that you've set up your panel, and it looks really nice on the computer screen, and then you got a um, print it out and your greens look very washed out and not as nice on, as on your computer. And that's because the CMYK palette can't get to those intense greens that you can get on the, on the computer screen. The other thing to be aware of is sensitivity and color blindness. So what I've done here is to show the same microscope image in using the blue lookup table, the green lookup table, and the red lookup table. Now, most people will see most uh, detail best in the green and red channels. So again, if we zoom in, hopefully you can see that you can, can't see much detail in the blue, but in the green and the red, it's a little bit clearer. So that becomes really important when you come to actually present your microscopy data, right? People who are also colorblind have difficulty using this red, green, blue um, merge image on the right here, they find it very difficult to decipher the green and the, and the red. And actually within Fiji, there's a tool which allows you to um, visualize what your image looks like if you had a certain type of color blindness. So my suggestion in this case would be to use grayscale as a way of actually showing your data. So first of all, you're seeing each of the channels equally and can decipher the information there independent of the color that's in there. And then, as not shown here, um, it's probably better to use a blue, green, magenta for the, for the merge. The other possibility is to use an inverted lookup table. So rather than the zero intensity values being black, they're white. Um, this can be very useful if you're printing things, saves on your black um, ink cartridge if you're printing at home, uh, but can also make things quite uh, easier to, to see as well. Okay, so if we go back to that color blindness issue, try and avoid the blue, green, red palettes and use things like cyan, yellow, red, cyan, yellow, magenta, or blue, green, magenta as well. 